Dragon Table, I'll be going over a tutorial on how to play Claustrophobia uh, by Asmodee. Uh, it is kind of a modern dungeon crawler. It is simpler than a lot of dungeon crawlers. There's not a lot of um, extra bits and pieces to worry about or to pick up on your way. It's just more about the battle between the two people playing, the humans versus the demons in a uh, twisting, cavernous, uh, labyrinth dungeon. Therefore, dungeon crawler. There also is dice rolling uh, that will affect the play, and um, dice rolling, of course, for combat. But I will show you all about that. So let's take a look. For this tutorial, I'm going to be going over the scenario that comes in the book that's called Survivors. It's generally the first one that you want to play. Um, it's kind of the introductory scenario and gets you used to the game. There's several scenarios that come with the game. There are also um, hints on how to make the game more difficult if you find that it's uh, not challenging enough for you. And just because of the way it's set up, you could really design your own game uh, using the pieces that are included, which is nice. In the first game, the human player has four characters. They have the Redeemer, they have the Condemned Brute, and they have two Blades for Hire. The demon character has uh, the possibility to send out a total of two demons during the game, um, and there are different types of demons that come with the game. They all look like this. It's all, it's this, this is the same miniature that you use. But there are different cards that indicate what that monster's abilities are. We'll take a closer look at his later, but they look like this. Um, and there's always an unending supply of troglodytes that can come out and attack. They're easy to kill, but they're large in numbers, so they can do a lot of damage. And um, my little setup here to sum up what happens in the Survivor's game, it really can look like this, especially if it's the first time you're playing and you're playing the humans and you don't roll well. So let's look at some of the other components. The human characters are each going to come with their own board and their own little storage system to put their board in. The way these work is the very first thing that you do during your turn is you roll for initiative. And you roll as many dice as you have players in the game, unless you have a card that says otherwise. So in this case, for instance, I would roll four dice. They're not going to end up being on screen. Okay. So there's my roll. I rolled one and two twos and a five. Now what you do with these dice is they actually get placed into this little hole and then you follow the line that says, for instance, for is this guy for the, for the uh, Redeemer, for number five, he would have one movement point, one combat point, and five defense points on this turn, if that's what I used. Um, and each row is slightly different. He's one, four, and three on the number one. And then, of course, these blades for hire would be the same. Um, their movement is 1, 2, and 4, if you use the number 2. So every turn you roll the dice and you're going to choose where to place, uh, who's going to get which die. Now during the game, if you take a wound, if you get hit by one of the demons, you have to block out one of the rows, and you do that with one of these little red tokens, and you can no longer use that row. So the next turn, if say I rolled certain numbers and one of them included a three, I wouldn't be able to use the three on him. Now, by the end of the game, it's possible that you have a lot of wounds taken and you won't have any choice. Um, in that case, if you do have to place a die with the number on um, the same, like let's say if there was a wound there and I had no choice, but I had to put a five on him, then he would be exhausted and he wouldn't be able to do anything that turn. He would just have a defense of three, and he would have to sit there and think about what he did. In the survivor's scenario, the Redeemer has some special abilities. He gets two cards, one of which is the Aura of Courage, and the other is the Aura of Precognition. And you notice at the top, 
there are dice. There's a two at the top of R of Courage, and there's a five at the top of R of Precognition. What that means is that you have to place a die in, either in the five spot to use the R of Precognition, or you have to place a die in the two in order to use the Aura of Courage. The Aura of Courage lets him bless another member of the party with a plus one movement, plus one combat, and plus one defense. The Aura of Precognition um, lets him choose a tile that's going to be explored. And I'll explain tiles in a minute, but normally they'll draw them randomly. Um, if he chooses to use the Aura of Precognition, he gets to look at the top three, choose the tile that's being placed, and he gets to choose um, how to place it. And then the other two tiles get put, put back in the order he chooses. And that is how those two cards work. So he will have those for the duration of the game. So you'll place those next to him while you're playing. If the Redeemer uses his Aura of Courage, then he would give this token to the player that he has blessed. And this is just to signify that it's a plus one all around to all stats. He'll also notice that he has a talent, which is listed right here. His talent is blessed. Um, he can, once per scenario, choose to bless another uh, warrior in his, uh, under his command uh, with either one movement, plus one movement for a turn, or plus two combat for a turn. Also, let's say, let's say he chooses to bless this guy, and this guy had gotten injured, um, so if this guy took an injury on uh, the third row and happened, and, and happened to have his die on the three on the same turn, if he's blessed by, this, um, by the Redeemer, he gets healed. But it's only used once per turn, and once this use is done, this gets put away for the rest of the game. Now you may notice that he has a talent as well. His talent is elusive. And that affects movement, which I'll explain later. And let's not leave out the Condemned Brute. He has two abilities. He has Bodyguard, which lets him take hits instead of another player that's in his space. He also has Impressive, which affects movement, which I will explain later. In the scenario of Survivors, one of your condemned blades for hire will also have a weapon. He will have a blunderbuss. It has a combat value of one, which means you can, means you can roll one die for it. And um, you have to keep track of which one of your guys has it. And uh, it means you can attack something that's a demon that's one space away from you, which normally you can't do. And he will have that for the entire game, unless he runs into some sort of card that tells him he can't have it anymore. So what do our poor demon friends have, you ask? It seems like the warriors have a, a lot of benefits. They've got to roll dice, they get blessings, they get weapons. Well, aside from having a big bad guy demon that could come out twice in this scenario, um, who has the following stats, whenever he comes out he has two movement points, one combat point, four defense points, and four health points, so it takes four hits to kill him. His other benefit is that he gets plus one combat per line of action that's canceled on the warrior, on the, uh, the target cards. So on the human cards, if you remember, bring those back out for a second, when someone takes a wound and they have to put one of these red lines in, that's the same as canceling a line of action. So in this case, if, uh, if out of all of the, the guys that I had, in, or that the human had in play, if there were two lines that were canceled, he would have plus two, which would be a total of three, to his combat. So he likes it when everybody's hurt. In addition to that, the demons have just sheer numbers on their side. I think they all jumped out of frame because they're troglodytes, so they're not very scary. But there are a lot of them. And there's no limit to the number of troglodytes you can have on the board at any time. I will explain how you can get them there in just a minute. For the survivor scenario, we play with this as the starting tile, which I'll put in the middle of the board when I zoom out. And our, our survivors, our humans, are going to start on this tile. 
and they're going to start uh, exploring. Um, and they are going to be looking for the breath of fresh air, which is going to be represented by a ten-sided die. It'll start on one, and as they explore the dungeon and lay tiles out, each time they explore a new tile and there's a new opening, the die will move to a new opening, the demon will move it, the demon player will move it, and it'll get put on a new space. And so they need to get to the 10 in order to find oh, the exit. Yay, the exit. Good luck finding the exit when you're being chased by troglodytes. Uh, but that's the goal of the game. The only way the humans can win is if they get two of their warriors out of the exit door. Um, the only way the demons can win is if they kill all of the human warriors. Any other result is a draw. So if only one human gets out, then it's a draw. And this is the one tile that no demons can ever enter. Demons cannot enter the exit tile. I don't know if it's the light. I think the light scares them. I'll go into more detail about how this die works and exploring the breath of fresh air uh, when I actually have zoomed out and show you what the other, some of the other tiles look like. This is a fun board. This is for the demons. So not only do the humans get to roll dice for initiative, but then the demons get to roll dice during the threat phase. Fun, fun party time. Uh, unless stated otherwise, the demon rolls three dice and then can choose where to put those dice. Some of these abilities are red. They're written in red. This one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. And those can only be used once per scenario. The ones that are written in black, which would be here, 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 and here, um, it's actually really dark green, but those can be used an unlimited number of times. Um, being able to roll an extra die of destiny obviously is, is a bit uh, of a bonus. And that's why it's any die, uh, any die score can be used for it, but you can only use it once per scenario. For this one, where you gain two threat points, uh, the dice must either be all odd or all even. So any dice that you put there. So let's say I could do this. I could put my two and my four here. And that would be using the space with all even dice. Over here, there's an ability called Dark Destiny, which lets you draw one event card per die, and you have to have a die uh, with a roll of three or more. Look at that. Look at that. Look what I got left over. I got a three. So I could put that there. That would allow me to draw an event card. And event cards come from this lovely pile. Very demon-y looking. See, it has a very demon-y face on it. And this lets you do all sorts of terrible things to the humans. So if you're demons, Collecting these event cards is not a bad idea. You can stock up on some of these. Um, the humans will have an ability to get cards on their own, um, called advantage cards, and they're probably about just as common as event cards. Event cards might be a little bit more common just because you always are going to have an option to get an event card. Whereas advantage cards are a little bit more chancy to come upon. But that's how you use this board. So each thing is a little bit different. So down here you need two dice with only odd scores and all your troglodytes will gain a movement point. Here you need one die that's odd and one die that's even and all your troglodytes will gain one defense which helps because they normally only have two defense. Um, I'll explain combat in a minute. And if at least one troglodyte is killed during the human player's action phase, or their next action phase, you'll get two threat points. This is a one that can only be used once per scenario. Um, two even dice will get you sharpened claws, where the troglodytes become frantic during the next action phase. And a warrior that's frantic can re-roll each combat die once if it did not produce a hit the first time. So if you have a bunch of troglodytes out and you get a chance and they, and they are in a, in a position where they're going to be able to attack their humans, that's the best time to use Sharpened Claws since you can only use it once per scenario. Um, it'll let you re-roll any hits that didn't hit the first time. Uh, we went over Dark Destiny. Um, 
a taste for blood. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, you would have to put a die resulting in exactly seven in order to do this one. This is also once per scenario. Um, this just means that uh, there's not going to be a limit on where you can place your demons if you've got new demons entering the board. Normally they cannot enter where there's a human present, uh, but if you have a taste for blood once per scenario, and you can ignore that. Um, if you have exactly 11, you can play burrowing monsters. This overrides the threat point rule, where normally you have to play threat points in order to bring troglodytes and demons out onto the board. In this case, you can bring out any number on any of the tiles where there are no humans present. This would be a good one to play if there are a lot of tiles out and all the humans have grouped together in one spot, because that would leave you a lot of tiles to put monsters on. Uh, if you have the number nine, you can do resistance is futile. Uh, this allows you to ignore the elusive trait for the human warriors, which is it has to deal with movement, and it lets your troglodytes be elusive when they normally are not. Again, that's once per scenario, and I will explain elusive when I explain movement. And if you have 12 or more, you can set a trap. And it's uh, a human warrior of your choice suffers a hit, so they and the player would then choose which action or which line of action uh, will be canceled. And that you can use an unlimited number of times, assuming that you want to use all your dice or at least 12 points worth um, in order to do that. This also summarizes your troglodytes. Uh, they obviously they're very easy to kill. They only have one movement point, one combat point, um, and three defense. I might have said two earlier by accident. I'm sorry, I meant three. So they're easy to kill, but you can have an awful lot of them and an unlimited number on the board. So that's how you use this lovely board. If you're a demon. Now let's zoom out and look at the whole playing field. So here's what the game may look like at the start of the scenario. Uh, I've just I've placed all of the human characters over here so they can be taken, keep track of easily of all the demon nonsense going on over here. And I've got my center tile in place with my human heroes at the center. Uh, I have set the one on the die at the opening where they have the breath of fresh air. And what they're gonna be doing now is rolling for initiative. The demon player does start with four threat points, which I've put on his board. It costs one threat point to bring out a troglodyte. It costs five threat points to bring out a demon. So my humans are gonna roll for initiative. And I've given the blunderbuss to uh, this particular condemned blade for hire, and I am going to have to remember which one he is once they start moving. Okay. So, if you remember from earlier, if I use a two on my redeemer, I can then use the aura of courage, which will allow me to bless one of my other characters. And I think I'm going to do that, so I will put the two here. And then let's see. Six, sixes and ones. Uh, everyone's going to have the same uh, movement. And not super high combat. I'm going to give him a uh, that one there. And I'm going to give this guy a one. I'm going to give... Actually, I'm going to give this guy a one. I'm going to give this guy a six because he has the uh, the blunderbuss, so he'll probably be only be attacking with one point anyways. He's probably not going to be doing it this turn because we don't have any demons on the board yet. These are the lines that they are going to follow. And he can bless someone with the aura of courage because I chose the two. And I believe that he is going to bless this condemned blade for hire. And the reason I'm going to bless him is because it's gonna allow him to explore a little bit, um, but it also, he has the elusive trait, 
and that will come into play uh, when I explain movement in a minute. Okay, so now that the human initiative phase is complete, the humans can take their action phase in which they will move and they would combat any demons if they were out on the board. Since the goal of this particular scenario is to get out, um, it makes sense to keep the, the, for the most part, to keep the humans together and follow the breath of fresh air and not split everybody up. It costs one movement point to turn over a tile. So I would choose to use the guy that has one extra movement this turn. Let's see. Yeah. This guy, the one without the blunderbuss, has one extra movement this turn. So we're going to send him over here and he's going to flip over a tile from the big gigantic, I'll show you, the big gigantic stack. There's, there's a lot of tiles. And the demon player gets to choose which direction it's turned. He has to put it where the breath of fresh air is, but he can choose how to place it. So let's say the demon chooses to place it like this. Now, um, they're all going to spend one movement point, because they all have one movement point left. Actually, they're not all going to spend a movement point. Um, I'm going to leave this guy behind. Um, there's a limit. For most of the tiles, except for this one, you can only have uh, three warriors of each type within the tunnel. There is a special kind of tunnel uh, that will only allow you to have one warrior of each type. This one allows you to have three, so I couldn't move him into here. What I could do is I could explore another tile, um, and I might as well. I have one movement point. I might as well explore a tile because it's possible that I could find a stash and a stash allows you to draw an advantage card. Um, so I'm going to say that he's going to explore here and we'll draw a tile. And then the, mon the, uh, the demon gets to place it. So this is not valid. The demon cannot place a tile where it has a dead end that's this close. There are some tiles that have dead ends that extend about halfway out. Those you're allowed to put down, but ones that have really, really close dead ends like this or this can't be used. Um, so let's say the demon does this because he's thinking, oh, maybe I can get these guys to go in a circle. <laughs> and for the purposes of this scenario, because they're still searching for the breath of fresh air, this die gets turned to a two. And then the demon places it where he wants, either on this opening or this opening. So he's going to place it there because his goal is he's going to try and get these guys to go in a circle because that would be fantastic. <laughs> so that's the end of the first play, the first turn for the humans. Now the demons would take a turn where the demon rolls uh, three dice and then they would take uh, actions based on what they rolled. Let's say they do this one, which is dice must be either all odd or all even. Um, oops. So they didn't roll very well this turn. Um, most of these required two dice. This one can only be used once per turn, and this requires three or more. So I'm just going to put all of my dice here and gain uh, two threat points per die. So I'll gain six threat points this turn. One, two, three, four five, six. And that's the threat phase. Now the demon player gets an action phase and that's when they can bring out um, troglodytes and demons. And to start with, um, I'm probably going to not bring out a demon to start with because I can only bring out a demon twice during the entire scenario. I don't want to get my demon out too early and waste him. Um, it's nice if I can get some of these guys split up a little bit, uh, I can do more with the demon. Um, but I can spend one threat point per troglodyte to bring them out onto the board. And a troglodyte can come out at any place where there's an opening where there are no humans present. 
So they're opening, there's an unexplored opening here, there's an unexplored opening here, but there are humans. So there's no troglodytes that can come out here. Same for this place. The only place open that troglodytes can come out is right here. So I'm going to, let's get a little group out. I'll spend three threat points and I will bring out my troglodytes. Now, if you remember from this board, troglodytes have a health of one, so they're easy to kill. Uh, they have a movement of one, a combat of one, which means they roll one die, and they have a defense of three. So let's say now the troglodytes have a movement of one, so they are going to move one space into here. So they're going to face off with this condemned brute. And three is the, the, the reason I brought three out and say not four is because you'd only have in these tunnels three warriors per side. So um, this, is, this space I believe can have five per side, but um, for this particular scenario, you're generally moving away from this space. So let, let, let's look at the condemned brute's uh, defense for this. Where is it? There he is. His current defense is only three. That's like actually the lowest that he can have. So each troglodyte has a combat score of one. So each would roll one die. So I can roll three dice for my troglodytes. And he has a, the uh, condemned brute has a defense of three. That means I need to roll a three or higher in order to hit him. Oh, two hits. So the condemned brute has no choice but to take two hits. So he's going to choose two lines that he has to eliminate. Not looking good for this guy. He's going to do that, um, and he'll do that. He does not get a chance to fight back this round. Uh, they get a chance to fight back during the next turn on the human's phase. And that is the end of one turn of claustrophobia. So the game would progress similarly. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I, I'm, not, I'm not normally doing playthroughs, but I'm going to do another turn just to show you what might happen on the next turn. These guys are still looking for a way out um, because all you have to do is you have to get two warriors to the end. They're not as concerned about leaving their friend behind. Um, the only thing that might benefit going back is uh, being able to possibly bless him and heal him one. He is not going to be able to move right now. You have to have the same number of enemies uh, e on either side in order to move. So he would have to be down to one troglodyte in order for him to move away. If I move one of these guys back in here, he wouldn't be able to move out until I was down to two troglodytes. Then I would be able to move out. The ones that can ignore that rule are these guys, the Condemned Blades for Hire, because they have the elusive trait. Since they're elusive, it doesn't matter how many enemies they're facing, they can always move away. Um, one of these guys, we'll say this one, does have a blunderbuss, so he could shoot back as part of his movement to try and take one of these guys out and help him. Um, but we'll see what happens. So the first thing that I'm going to do is we're going to roll for initiative for the humans. Okay. So a twos and a sixes will not work for this guy. And we know he's going to be fighting. If I give him a defense of five, a combat of two, he'd only be able to roll two dice. But I'm going to do that because he's taken some damage. I don't want him to take any more. Um, let's see. I'm going to give him the two because that's going to give him the aura of courage and let him bless someone. So he's going to uh, give the, the blessing to this condemned brute. Does have the one pers one time per scenario he can bless somebody else and take away their wound if it's the one that is in use. So if I had chosen one that was in use, I could have healed a, a line of his, but with only two wounds, I'm not as worried about it. 
So now I need to choose for these guys. Um, let's see, we'll give this guy the six and this guy the one. So let's say the first thing that I'm going to do now is um, the other rule is you can either move and then combat or you can combat and then move, but you cannot move, combat, and then move some more. So if you have enough movement points to do more than one move, you can't, for instance, move, pew, 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 fight, and then move again or move back out, for instance. Your combat would stop movement. Um, but you could combat and then move. So let's say for this guy, this is the guy with the, with the blunderbuss. Um, I'm going to have him shoot at one of these troglodytes. So he gets to roll one die. And the troglodytes have a defense of three, so I need to roll three or higher. And he does not hit one. Sorry, buddy. So... Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to have him explore because this is the guy, actually neither one of them have to have two movement points, doesn't matter. So he's going to explore. So I pull a random tile and now the demon can place it. So he is going to place, oh, and this is a, uh, ugh, lovely. This is a booby trapped tile. You can tell by the skull and crossbones here. So I'm going to, I have to place this. I'm going to place this here. And then as the demon, I have to turn this die to a three and I have to place it on an unexplored opening, which would be over here. And if for some reason you ever uh, have a situation where you're circling back or you don't have an unexplored uh, opening to put the die on, you put it on the next closest one. So in this case, it would be over here. So if this, for instance, was just looked like this, um, the next closest open space would be back here, but it's not, so we'll put this here. But the first human that moves into here is going to have to roll a die to see what happens to him. So I'm going to send this guy out. So he's already used his movement point to uncover the tile. So he's going to use his movement point to move in there, and then he gets to roll a die to see what happens to him. On a one, nothing happens, so we're hoping for a one. On a two or a three, he suffers a hit. On a four, he must immediately end his movement, which is fine because he doesn't have any more movement anyways. Uh, on a five, a troglodyte gets placed on the tile. And on a six, he suffers two hits. So we'll see how much the dice like me today. Oh, the dice, the dice like the humans today. Nothing happens. So he's the one that triggered the booby trap. So now this doesn't matter anymore. Um, it's, not, it's no longer booby trapped. And we're going to send our wonderful Redeemer forward one as well. And now the Brute has a chance to fight back. He's been blessed, so he gets a plus one on all his stats. He's at three. He has a combat score of, of three plus one is four, and a defense of four plus one is five. So he can roll four dice against the troglodytes. And whenever you're fighting troglodytes, it counts as one battle. So however many hits I roll is the number of troglodytes that kill. So anything that I roll that's three or above is a hit on a troglodyte. Oh, man, he just took his axe side thing and just wiped all of those troglodytes out. So they are all gone. Good job. Good job. Now, like I said, you can do either movement and combat, or you can do combat and then movement. So he just did combat, he's got one movement point, actually he has two movement points, so he's going to move here, um, and he's going he's gonna to stay here. He's going to stay here and maybe help protect this guy. And that would be the end of the human turn. And now the demon would take their turn, where they roll their die, place them, uh, and then they would take their action, uh, placing troglodytes, placing demon out. The demon could go out, rawr, and trying to kill the humans. And that's basically how the game works. Now, there's some special tiles I'm going to show you that may come up during the game. Let's see what we can find. Here's an example of one that's a dead end. So these dead ends you can't use. You could not put that here. 
or actually it would have to, it'd be, it'd be over here is where they'd be exploring, but you could put it here. So basically the next tile that would come up would be this one. So now you're in a circumstance where you don't have a, uh, so you would have to go back to the closest open air spot, which would be back here. And I'm just skipping ahead a little bit in the turns, but that's how that, that's how that would work if you come up with a dead end. Oh, here's a good tile. It's an example of a burrowing hole. There's a hole that the troglodytes can go through. Once this tile is out, it's called a hole in the ground. The demon player then can then take one tile and put another hole in the ground someplace else on the board. Say they wanted to put a hole in the ground here. And the troglodytes can spend one movement point to go through the hole in the ground. The demon cannot. He's too, he's much too, look at this, look, look at this guy. He's too fat. He got, he's got way too much junk in the trunk to fit through that hole. But the troglodytes can go through it. This is an example of a stash. It's also another dead end. So if our heroes were following this route continually, they would have to double back and head back out this way. So you can see how it's not so straightforward as just following a line to get out. It is a bit of a, a maze. Um, but this is a stash token right here. And if one of the humans entered this space, the first time they entered it, they would get to draw an advantage card from the deck. Much like the demons can get event cards that can screw with the humans, the humans can get um, advantage cards that help them with the demons. This one, for instance, is a lucky amulet. See? Shiny. Ooh. This one lets you select one of the action die and change its score to a score of your choice during the initiative phase. That's really helpful towards the end of the game if you've got a lot of injuries and you're trying to avoid having to place a die on an injured line. But that's what that does. What's another special tile? Ah, here's an example of a tile, a, a, a tunnel that is tight. That's what that symbol means. It means it's a tight tunnel. You can only have one of each type of warrior in the tunnel at a time. No more. Nobody else can enter. Two may enter. One may leave. Probably. And this is an example of a tile that's underwater. When a human moves into a tile that's underwater, it ends their movement, and it takes all of their movement points to get out of the tile. Uh, so even if you have more than one movement point, you're only, it's going to take all of your movement just to get through, get into this tile, and then to get out of the tile. Because it's hard to swim, because there's things in there. There's scary things in the water. Ooh. There's a skeleton and creepy fish. So. When you bring a demon into play, it's the same rules as for the troglodytes, but you co it costs you one, two, three, four, five threat points. But they also can only come out of unexplored uh, areas. So in this particular, I mean, this is not obviously this is just this was just me laying out tiles. The only unexplored places without humans is here. This is unexplored, but there's a human on this spot right now. So the demon would have to move here. And all warriors, whether they're humans or demons, are affected by uh, the rules that, that are in the tiles, except for uh, the booby trap and the, um, well, except, except for the booby trap and um, the stash. Uh, he has to deal with the movement issue as well. So if he moved into this tile, that would end his movement. He wouldn't have any more movement that turn. And once he's in play, you get to put his card out. And then he follows those. And as he takes hits, if he gets attacked, if he gets into an epic battle, he'll take hits. And once he's got taken four hit points, once he takes the last one, that's three, once he takes the last one, he gets removed from the game, and he can come back one more time during this scenario. There are several different types of demons, and they differ depending on the scenario that you're playing. There are a couple more tile types I want to show you. This tile, I'll turn it, 
with this symbol on it that has a little picture of like a little troglodyte head. Um, the demon player, this is a layer. The demon player can always make troglodytes appear on the square, even if there are humans present, uh, or even if there aren't any um, unexplored places. Even if it was, even if it was say over here, and there weren't any unexplored openings, you could still make troglodytes appear there because it's a layer. This one is a uh, demonic mechanism. Uh, when this comes out, uh, the first time a human enters this particular tile, it would trigger the demonic effect, and the next turn, the demon player would get to roll one extra die during his threat phase. There's also hungry tunnels. There are tunnels with tentacles in them. When you're standing in a tentacle tunnel, any wounds received during combat uh, are resolved as two hits instead of one hit. Um, that includes troglodytes and demons. Uh, so it affects humans, troglodytes, and demons. The tentacles, Cthulhu does not care. The tentacles don't care. They will eat anything. They just love the taste of blood, whether it's human, troglodyte, or demon. And uh, if you score a hit during combat, you actually score two hits. So if you had two troglodytes here, let's say, let's say you had two troglodytes here and you were fighting and you had one hit, both troglodytes would die because it's resolved as two hits in the hungry tunnels. So that's basically how the game works. Um, the specifics of each scenario are different. I kind of introduced you to the first scenario where every time you place a new tile down, you're, op you're, you're turning this die and placing it on the nearest open airspace. And remember, the demon gets to place tiles. The demon also gets to place where the air source is coming from. Um, so basically, if I had done it the way it should have been done, they really would be technically farther out. But I didn't, I didn't include any of the the fight sequences they would have to encounter along the way. Um, they would be much more injured by this point, not nearly as close to victory as you would think. Uh, but it's really fun, it's a great two-player game, um, it's not too complicated for a dungeon crawler, and uh, I hope you enjoy playing it. Thanks for visiting the Dragon Table, I'll see you next time!